I'd like to call to order today's hearing, focusing on one of the most critical issues in the world today, responding to the drought and famine in the Horn of Africa. We will hear from Mr. Votershop, the Assistant Country Director for Care International Somalia, who is based in Nairobi and recently returned from a visit to drought-affected areas of Somalia. Senator Isaacson. Well, thank you, Chairman Coons, and I want to welcome all those who will testify today. I want to particularly uh, thank Vowder Shop from the uh, CARE USA, headquartered in my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, for being here, as well as so many of the other CARE people that are here. I have had the privilege of being on site with CARE in Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and in Darfur in the Sudan, and seen firsthand what our NGOs do to deliver humanitarian aid, as well as in the case of CARE, life-sustaining techniques that people can learn to be self-sustaining among themselves, which is so critical in areas of, of bad poverty and not, what, not well educated. So I appreciate CARE being here and testifying today. I'm always proud to have the home team here talking about the good things that they do. Mr. Shop. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Senator Isaacson, thank you very much for this opportunity you've given us to testify today on this, this horrible situation that we're facing in, in the Horn of Africa. Um, I speak today on behalf of CARE, a leading international humanitarian organization fighting global poverty. And with six decades of experience in helping people prepare for and respond to natural disasters, providing life-saving assistance in crises and helping communities recover after an emergency. We place special um, focus on women and children. And yet again, in this crisis, they bear the brunt of, of, of what's happening. Um, myself, as Assistant Country Director for Programs for Care in Somalia, I see firsthand in, in, in my work the consequences that tens of thousands of people are facing today. Um, I've worked in the Horn for seven years now, traveling extensively within Somalia, both in the north and in the south. I recently returned to a, from a trip to IDP camps and drought-affected areas in the north. And what we see there is probably less dramatic than what we see in some parts of the South, yet the stories we hear are horrible. Um, a woman that I met in, in, in one of the IDP camps in Gardo, um, with a severely malnourished child on her arm, explained to me she didn't have any money to go to the, to the health clinic to seek assistance for her child, and that assistance was not available there. You could see in her eyes that she was severely traumatized by the experiences uh, in the South and the things that she had, had seen there. I, I met a father in the, in, in, in the Sanag region who had recently lost, lost his, his wife, and he was there nursing his five remaining cows. The cows were bleeding from their noses, and he was trying to do something about it, but not really knowing what to do. And our staff said, well, this is a lost, lost cause. These kind of experiences my staff see on a very regular basis, and they are stories that, that remain with you for, for, for the rest of your life. Our response to the emergency in the Horn began to scale up in 2011, the beginning of 2011, when the early signs were, were clear that, that this was going to be a major crisis. Uh, today we're helping more than one million people in Ethiopia, Somalia, and Kenya with life-saving food, water, nutrition, and other life-saving emergency assistance. Care, for instance, is one of the largest agencies working in the DADAP. We also support longer-term activities that help people become more res resilient to, to drought. The severity of the situation is extremely worrying, and other speakers have spoken at length about that, so I will keep my remarks on that quite short. But the worry is that the situation is not at its worst yet. Um, the, the deepest part of a drought is normally the month before the rains come, and then people are weakened, and so by September we're going to see a significantly increased number of deaths due to diseases um, that affect these already weakened populations. Um, so, as, as my colleagues have said, agencies know now how to deal with this kind of situation and that we need to focus on a broad range of services of water, sanitation, health, nutrition, food. Um, and, and address those multiple causes of, of deaths in a, in a famine crisis. However, unfortunately, there's still a major funding gap in the region uh, of about 1.4 billion US dollars for the, uh, for the consolidated appeal of the UN. Um, this is really a worry, notwithstanding all the generous uh, contributions from various donors, and we really appreciate the support from the US government for our work 
in industry countries uh, where, where we've been supported by BPRM, OFDA and, and others. And we really appreciate that. However, it's not enough. The crisis is so massive, it needs additional support. The access issues have been discussed at length. Um, the ongoing conflict in the south is making it much more difficult to get access to the south. Um, and what we're seeing is that agencies already present there, local NGOs, other international NGOs that work there, have uh, an ability to negotiate some, some level of access, but it, it is limited. Um, and unfortunately, aid is at risk of becoming very politicized in this environment. It's very important for all sides to this, this conflict to let humanitarian principles, neutrality, impartiality guide all of our discussions on humanitarian assistance. And we're determined to provide only assistance to those people that are most in need. And we have systems to, to, in place to ensure that only those people get it. We are urging local authorities in, in southern Somalia to grant and un, 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 uninhibited and unconditional access. Um, but the crisis is happening now and it needs a concerted, thoughtful, careful diplomatic work of UN donors and NGOs to get aid to the victims of famine wherever they are. And now is really the time to have space and reach out to all parties of the conflict and work to save the lives of tens of thousands of people and to avoid politicization of the issues. Um, we have been speaking with, with colleagues in the U.S. government about the legal issues that have concerned us. Um, and we really appreciate the recent steps taken by the U.S. government, specifically for um, programs funded by USAID and the Department of State. Questions, however, remain on the ability of U.S. government, U.S. Uh, NGOs to program funding from non-U.S. government donors. For instance, the U.S. public, uh, NGOs get large sums of money from the U.S. public, but they, this funding doesn't fall under the, 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 the OFAC licensing that is now being put in place for NGOs. That would be only be covered and if you have funding from the U.S. government for South Central Somalia. Other funding like ECHO, DFID, that would not be covered for U.S.-based NGOs, and those are major sources of funding for U.S.-based NGOs. The long-term implications, need, we need to start thinking about those as well now. And I'm sorry I'm running a little bit over, over time. Um, the, these are very marginalized populations, and they're among the most vulnerable to the impact of, of changes in the weather patterns. When I started working on Somalia, we see the drought every five years. Now it's just a continuous cycle of missed seasons, and, 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 and things are really changing, and people finding it very difficult to adjust to these, these changes. But we know that there are things that we can do to help that, and we need to invest in that in, in, in the years to come. Um, our recommendations, I, I just want to sum up um, the, the the expansion and the speed of funding for the crisis is, 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 is really important. Um, the urgency is, is, is there, um, but we're seeing that major donors take quite substantial time for funding to become available on the ground to, to support our work. And this, uh, we urge donors to be, be faster in their processes and, and move things forward. We need to start planning for increased long-term support for resilience in these areas. And we need concerted, thoughtful and careful diplomatic work of UN donors and NGOs to negotiate access on the ground and help to support a public climate in which those efforts can actually take place by the agencies working there. And the efforts by the US government to ease legal restrictions for US government funded work is really appreciated. But it's not enough because we are at risk when we use other government, other governments' funding and U.S. public funding, for instance. So, on that last item, we really need some very urgent action forward. Um, the NGO community is ready to engage the appropriate U.S. government agencies to develop constructive options to alleviate the effects of famine while controlling the risk of diversion. And there are precedents for this in BAM in Iran and more recently in Gaza. And that could be achieved in two different ways. Uh, first, issuance of a general license from OFAC that would reduce the risk of prosecution due to transactions that may be incidental to the famine response. And secondly, favorable and very expeditious processing of specific license requests to OFAC from US-based NGOs. Those things would really help agencies 
place themselves in a position where they can start negotiating for access on the ground. Thank you. Uh, I noted that um, Bob LaPrade was supposed to testify today, but you are in his place. It causes me to make an observation for the people here today. Um, Mr. LaPrade, who's with CARE International, couldn't be here today because he suffers from malaria. It reminded me that my first trip with CARE to Ethiopia, in Owasa, Ethiopia, the CARE representative that I worked with also had malaria. And so I want to thank you for the risk that you take in very dangerous parts of the world to deliver humanitarian aid and hope. And CARE's organization and many other NGOs like it, people don't, I think, sometimes equate the risk and the exposure of your own health that you put to help other people. So thank you for doing that. I'd like to follow up, if I could, Mr. Schaff, on a comment you made earlier about in response to the earthquake that was in Iran, I think 2003, that there was a, um, an exception to the licensing procedure by OFAC that was granted more broadly that might be a useful example here. Could you elaborate on that? I don't have the technical details as such, but we can get back to you on, on that. I mean, certainly from all of our witnesses today, we're looking for um, a responsible, swift, and appropriate path forward. Uh, I understand, despite uh, my comment earlier, I understand that uh, different entities within the United States government are charged with enforcing um, different um, legal obligations and that sometimes uh, the desire for prompt and effective humanitarian assistance runs up against uh, the barriers that we put uh, in place in order to prevent uh, assistance from being uh, provided wittingly or unwittingly uh, to those who are also uh, enemies of the United States and, and pose a real threat to the international order. Um, I'd be interested in your input, if I could, uh, sort of my last three questions here. Um, first, about future planning, about how the United States uh, can better assist the countries in the region, um, particularly here in the Horn of Africa, where the climactic conditions seem to be worsening. Uh, how do we help them build resilience, sustainable capacity uh, to deal with these crises um, so that we don't uh, face them more periodically? Um, second, um, several of you have referenced uh, threatened cuts to U.S. aid. Uh, the House has taken up the relevant budget and has proposed, I think, or, I think Mr. Kanindek uh, suggested it was a 30 percent cut over last year, 50 percent over the, uh, the 08 uh, funding levels. Um, how do you see uh, our efforts to sustain American engagement um, with development, with assistance uh, playing out, and what suggestions might you have for us and how to uh, help the average American understand why there is value in doing this, not just from a humanitarian perspective, but a strategic perspective. I think the the, the need for recovery and, and, and resilience programming is, is, is extremely high, and I think it's important to get that the planning for that started now, even while we're in, in, in such crisis. Um, there are a lot of things that, that NGOs and others are doing in, in these areas around you know, ensuring livestock health, ensuring improvement of natural resource management, uh, vocational training to diversify the income streams that, that, that people have. Um, say, we care does a lot of work on savings groups to, to help ensure asset diversification so people have some liquid assets during, during a drought. So there are a lot of things that can be done and, and this needs to be scaled up in response to the drought because people have lost all of their assets and we, we want to avoid a situation where after this drought um, and after this, this, this massive crisis, because it's going to be massive, um, people are left for, for a long period of time while agencies are planning for recovery and, and, and resilience programming afterwards. Um, if I may add a point on your earlier comment on bureaucratic uh, obstacles and, and aid delivery coming through quickly. This is, this is a serious concern. Um, we, we're looking at a two, three min, month window of opportunity in which we can still save lives. Um, with what, the, the pace we have seen, not just with, with US government donors, but other donors as well, it takes multiple, multiple months to get through the process. And the, the added complications of, of US um, anti-terrorist regulations have added significant periods of time and, and that's really worrying also going forward now that we have such a short time frame to prevent more deaths. Thank you, Mr. Chap. Mr. Kalindek. Uh Yeah, and I would, uh, again, fully endorse what uh, Mr. Schaub has said about uh, the need to build resiliency. I would... Mr. Schaub is nodding his head in agreement with that answer, I think, but I want to be sure and give you a chance to express yourself. 
Yeah, I just want to add to that is that there is also in, in Nairobi with agencies working in Somalia a constant dialogue about what mechanisms we have in place to to, to severely limit the, the, the ability of di diversion to happen. And there is a, the leadership of the, the UN humanitarian coordinator on this has been quite strong in the last couple of months to really push back on those initiatives that have been pushing for taxation, et cetera, et cetera, on the ground. And, um, and our systems internally are, are, are very tight to make sure that whatever we pledge to provide to beneficiaries actually go into beneficiaries and not anywhere else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Senator Isaacson, thank you uh, very much uh, for joining me. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Kanindik, uh, Dr. Fahm, and uh, Mr. Schaap. Um, for your personal service, for the risks you've taken uh, in order to deliver relief, for the leadership role that your organizations have taken, and for the um, insight you've given us and um, the world as folks have deliberated over this humanitarian crisis. Uh, as you've helped make clear today, uh, this is the gravest humanitarian crisis facing the world today. 